For those people who don't know me, I'm Labour's parliamentary candidate for this constituency uh, of Basildon and Billericay. Uh, in the general election that is now just 246 days away. Um, I was elected to do this job in December last year and I have never seen a room full of so many people turn up at one of my fundraisers, so I guess you're not here to see me. <laughs> it's not great for the ego, I won't lie. Um, on behalf of Mike Nassaf, our parliamentary candidate in South Basildon, uh, and myself, uh, I want to welcome you all to the Towngate Theatre uh, for a talk on the NHS with our special guest, uh, Professor Lord Robert Winston, whom I shall say more about in just a moment. Tonight marks the midway point in the Basildon Labour Party's first ever uh, Health Awareness Week. It's a campaign which Mike and I chose to run after talking to thousands of residents across the town and spending a summer trawling through page after page of Basildon Hospital and uh, CCG data provided to us under the Freedom of Information Act. In other words, it's the stuff they don't want you to know about. And what we found and what we've heard is quite frankly scary. Our local NHS is fragmented. In many areas it's not fit for purpose and in just a few years it won't exist at all. On every single level, the NHS has gone backwards, not forwards, under David Cameron, and we need to stop it. Every step of the way, he has been supported by Basildon's two local MPs, John Barron and Stephen Metcalf. And it's because of how our local Tory MPs have voted that David Cameron could launch a top-down reorganisation of the NHS that has cost us taxpayers £3 billion. Here in South Essex, it means that £26 million has been taken away from frontline patient care to rebrand his clinical commissioning services. It has meant that he sat 358 full-time permanent nurses at our hospital and that our hospital has been placed into special measures for, amongst other reasons, unsafe staffing levels. And it means that there's a reliance on forensic agency nurses to plug the gaps of the nurses uh, who have gone and whilst those who remain are forced to work longer hours stretching them to their very limits. In March, my family and I saw firsthand at the hospital the same nurses working 12, 13, 14, 15 hour days, as many as six days a week. Junior doctors forced to care for patients on not one or two wards, not even three, but on four, with some of those patients declared, and I quote, very seriously, gravely ill. And to kick them in the teeth even harder, John Barron has confirmed to me in writing that he will be the first Basildon MP in history to ignore the Pay Commission's recommendation for all doctors and nurses to receive a 1% pay rise. David Cameron is asking our NHS to do the impossible, even more with even less. And it doesn't end there. In our GP surgeries, we are now routinely waiting weeks on end for an appointment. I've now found out that we have more than £875 million of investment needed to fund additional GP surgery facilities because we can't cope with existing demand. That's not me saying it, that's the Department of Health's own experts. With a crisis in recruitment throughout Essex, in GP recruitment throughout Essex, with 47% of our current GPs who are practicing already over the age of 50 and rapidly heading towards retirement. Our A&E has missed its waiting time targets in virtually every single week of the last 12 months. Patients needing operations who should have those operations within 18 weeks are having to wait even longer because over the next five years, David Cameron is set to take £74.1 million out of Basildon's local NHS budget. Just when you think things couldn't get any worse, we, found, we find out this week that ambulance response times have on average doubled since Cameron came to office. That is leaving people in this town living in the knowledge that if they have an accident, even a call to 999 won't necessarily guarantee that an ambulance will arrive in time to give them the life-saving treatment that they might need. Think about that. Now imagine a Prime Minister who would sack enough NHS doctors and nurses that suspected cancer patients would have to wait more than two weeks to see a specialist. Well, you don't need to imagine here in Basildon.
because on David Cameron's watch, that was the reality for 150 people in the first quarter of this year. And it doesn't have to be like this. When Labour left office, the NHS enjoyed the highest patient satisfaction rates since its inception. Patients received first-class care. Waiting time targets were introduced and then they were met. Cancer deaths had reduced by 56,000. Record numbers of doctors and nurses in our hospitals and GP surgeries. Today, our NHS is in crisis. We have the lowest patient satisfaction rates in Basildon since John Major was Prime Minister. Almost 50% of services are moving into the private sector. Restrictions are being placed on more and more treatments and healthcare free at the point of use is very much in jeopardy. The NHS wasn't like this in 2010, and it doesn't have to be like this in 2015. What Mike and I have uncovered over the last six weeks has led us to two conclusions. Firstly, under no circumstances can you ever trust the Tories with the NHS. And second, and it's a very simple conclusion, what is going on in Basildon's NHS just isn't right. And we want you to vote for us so that we can change it. In May, if you elect Mike and I, this is what we'll do. First, I speak, as I speak, hundreds of mental health patients in Basildon are being sent to Norwich and Northampton for their treatment. We'd end that by bringing mental health services back to South Essex and making healthcare provision in our town more joined up. Second, new GP surgeries are needed in Landon, St Martins, in Friens and in Pitsy. According to Hansard, our two Tory MPs have never once mentioned this on the floor of the House of Commons in the four and a half years that they've represented this town. Vote for Mike and I, we will lobby the government every single week until it happens. And if you make us, uh, make us your MPs, we will walk through the lobbies of the House of Commons and vote to repeal David Cameron's health and social care bill, which has privatised more of the NHS in the last four years than we have seen in the last four decades. You see, as your local MPs, Mike and I, want to return to a Basildon NHS that is relentlessly focused on saving more lives, stopping more pain and distress, treating patients even better, making the National Health Service an institution the envy and pride of the world. I believe that Labour's plans for our health service, the introduction of whole person care, integrating the social, physical and mental aspects of the service, combined with the advances in science and technology, has the potential to be one of the most exciting projects happening in our country for decades to come. It's why I'm grateful to our special guest for answering my call to come and address you here in Basildon tonight. Professor Winston has spent his life defending the NHS, its values, its principles and its place in modern Britain, as well as dedicating his life to the advancement of crucial medical research. Lord Winston is a Professor of Science and Society, an Emirates Professor of Fertility Studies at Imperial College London, as well as Chancellor of Sheffield Hallam University. He has visited and guest lectured at more UK universities than any other academic in recent years. He has authored more than 300 scientific publications, and his Queen Charlotte Appeal raised over £13 million to build and equip the most re advanced reproductive research centre in Europe with space for 130 scientists and doctors working to improve the health of women and babies. As a member of the House of Lords since 1995, he speaks on science and healthcare, adding some of the most articulate arguments of any parliamentarian to debates on reforms of our health service. You may know him from his BBC science programmes such as Your Life in Their Hands, Child of Our Time and Human Minds. I'm honoured and privileged that we have a man of his stature here, eventually, as a guest of the Basildon Labour Party tonight. So please put your hands together and welcome Professor Lord Robert Winston. I want you to think of getting on the tube at Westminster. Westminster, as you know, is on the district line, and it's also on the Jubilee line. District line's fine. If you get on the Jubilee line and you go east, I, in the direction vaguely of Basildon, and you get off at Canning Town, that's a distance of just seven miles. And the interesting thing about that seven miles is that in Westminster, 
the average longevity of the average male is around 78 now. And in Canning Town, you travel seven miles and it's seven years less. Okay. Now, throughout the United Kingdom, there are extraordinary inequalities in healthcare. The worst example, actually, is probably in Coulton in Glasgow. Now, I know that that's rather an interesting issue this week and next week. Um, I hope we don't devolve Scotland completely to its own thing. It's very interesting that actually Coulton probably has the worst death record for males in any civilised country. In fact, in Coulton, the male longevity is about 54. Amazingly, it's actually lower than it is in Mozambique, lower than it is in Mali, lower than it is in at least half a dozen very poor African countries. That's the United Kingdom, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, you want the microphone? Yeah. So that, that's the United Kingdom. Now, one of the real issues then is that we have this extraordinary unequal health service, which is actually no longer national. And the key thing that's really happened, the biggest single injury, in my view, unquestionably, and this is not because I'm a politician, I don't see myself as a politician, I see myself basically as somebody who tries to be reasonably expert in the field I can be and to offer advice when I can do in the House of Lords. House of Lords at its best is actually not very political. The key injury was in 2012 when Lansley produced the social care, social, um, sorry, the, the health and social care bill, which became an act of parliament just two years ago. Now, the full effect of that act of parliament, in my view, has not yet finished, but it's a disaster. In my view, it's a shocking, shocking piece of legislation. And there are a number of things about this which are very, very influential. And I think you need to consider very carefully how you vote in the next election because of that massively important bill. You will remember in the hustings when there was for the first time a television debate between the three party leaders, between, um, uh, uh, with Nick Clegg of course and Cameron as being uh, present all at that time, all separated from the Labour Party. And you will remember very clearly that Cameron absolutely pledged that he would not attempt another reform of the health service. He said it was the last thing that was needed. And Clegg signed up to that and agreed completely. In fact, what they did was to produce the most savage reform which has ever been produced in the health service since its inception in 1948. I don't know why they did this. I think it's basically because they want to ration health care. And I think undoubtedly, at the basis of this is going to be extraordinarily wrong for many people in many parts of, of Britain. And I think Essex is one very good example where this is not an advantage. It's certainly very bad for London. You may know, of course, that now under the present government, there is a massive financial black hole. In West London, where I've done most of my working life, we're still facing at one of the leading hospitals in Europe, Hammersmith Hospital, one of the great research centres, one of the most innovative places really anywhere, we're facing a 50 million deficit in a hospital which has been pretty well managed but just simply can't cope with actually what is needed by the population. And that is repeated across the country. There are various estimates of that black hole. Um, the very least is that it's probably about 3 billion the other end of the spectrum, it may be as many as 20 billion. Now, every single one of you in this audience, myself included, I'm now in my 70s, all of us are going to get old. Last week, my neighbor, um, whose husband had been ill for about three years in care uh, with Parkinson's disease and unable to get out and no longer able to be nursed at home, was admitted to a major London teaching hospital. He ended up in coma, and it was obvious that he was going to die. Uh, Don died last week, I went to his funeral. Well, the funeral was last week, and he died the week before that. When he was dying in that teaching hospital, 
his wife went to see him every day, of course, where towards the end when he was unconscious, she kept on talking to him. Now, just for your information, uh, most of you presumably are not medical or nursing, but you should know that the last sensation that we lose is our sense of hearing and the ability to understand even when we seem to be deeply comatose. That work was done by a man called Owen in Cambridge, and he showed that people, even people who are completely in a vegetative state, had responses in their brain showing that they could understand what was going on around them. That's absolutely clear. And that should be embedded in the knowledge of every single nurse, for example. When she said, you know, isn't anybody going to offer him, uh, you know, some fluid perhaps, um, uh, because he was still, he was dehydrated, um, the nurse said, Madam, don't you understand? He's completely unconscious. He can't hear a word of what you're saying. There's no point in talking to him, you know. I don't know why you're here. And she walked off. My neighbor went to see her and said, look, you know, he's lying in bed. He's not been washed. He's not been shaved for five days. Um, can, something, can you do something about that? This is not my job. I'm busy with the paperwork on the desk. So if you want that to happen, go and speak to the ward orderly. He's supposed to be doing that. So she goes to the ward orderly, and the ward orderly says this to this woman who's now a widow with her dying husband in front of the man. She says, he's not my top priority at the moment, and walked off. That's the health service, ladies and gentlemen, that we are creating. It's a health service which is not fundamentally focused on the most important issue. And you know what the most important thing is? When I was a medical student, you know what I learned? There's one gesture you never make in front of a patient. It's not raising two fingers, by the way, or raising your middle finger like a motor bicyclist. Do you know what it is? It's this, looking at your watch, not listening, saying that you're in a hurry, you can't cope. But now, of course, what's happening with the increasing changes in the health, health service is that it's becoming more and more administered, but not managed. So this health act means that now nurses no longer look after patients or feed them. They don't actually wash them. They're sitting behind a desk. They're filling in forms. And that's what they do most of the time. And those are the backbone of our health service. And that's increasingly how they're being taught to nurse. So in fact, now, when, you have, when you're old and you're in hospital, you may sit in a four-bedded ward, or you may sit in your own feces. Uh, this is absolutely, frankly, true. This is what happened to my mother, um, where food is put in front of you, but because you don't feel hungry, or you don't have the appetite, there's nobody to feed you, or you can't feed yourself. And of course, you're demented because you're in a strange so surrounding. And actually, basically, the nurses are almost waiting for you to just simply go into that coma. That's increasingly what's happening with old people. And we see that really more now in the health service, in my view, than we've ever seen it. Now, I want to say one thing that is political, but it's not meant to be. There's an independent review of health services across the world, which you may not have heard of. It's called the Commonwealth Fund, and it's nothing to do with the British Commonwealth. It's a charity based in Washington. And the Commonwealth Fund, and you can look it up on the web if you want to, published annual reports, and they continue to publish annual reports. And of course, the last report they published is before the 1912 Act, although, of course, it came out in the beginning of January this year, 19, uh, 2014. In fact, it really refers to 2012, which is before, of course, we modified everything that we're doing. When the Labour Party left power, uh, 2009, the Commonwealth Fund did an audit of all health services in the advanced world. It turns out that the per capita spend on patients in the UK is around about £2,008 per head overall. It's more in Scotland, it's more in Wales, it's more actually in Northern Ireland. It's a bit less in England, but not much less. It varies very much, and that's how it's been um, made because of the need 
to deal with certain populations, particularly the Scots, as you might imagine. The Scots don't realize how lucky they are, actually, with the investment in their health service. In America, the cost per capita of a health service is two and three quarter times that amount. So our health service is more than 200% cheaper than the one in America. What may surprise you, it's cheaper than the French service. It's cheaper than the German service. It was cheaper when the Labour Party left than the Italian, the German, the Swiss, the French, the Spanish services. And when you looked at patient satisfaction, as Gavin has just said, it was actually higher. It was, in fact, the highest in Europe. That's independent, nothing to do with any politician measuring this. This is actually the King's Fund, which is an independent body, and of course, what was being shown overseas compared with, um, with us. And in fact, it's also true that you might say, well, of course, actually the results weren't so good. Well, the Commonwealth Fund looked at results, and in particular, it looked at the problems which we're most likely to face, which of course is an aging society, as we all are, so they looked at things like hip, hip replacements, knee replacements, rehabilitation. They didn't look at mental health, which is another issue, but they looked at a whole range of issues which are associated with degenerative diseases, which are by far the commonest things that we deal with, of course, in hospitals, really, because that's what we mostly actually suffer with at some time. And it turned out that we'd actually done, in the, with the Blair government and then his successor, with Brown, we'd actually done more hip operations, more knee operations, more rehabilitation type procedures than anywhere else in Europe, and the success rate was actually better. Never been demonstrated before. It's hardly ever talked about. And the Labour Party even doesn't even make a mention of that. But actually, by the time the Labour Party left office, there really was a proper investment. Um, you may remember that, you know, in fact, I, had, I was headlines because I quarreled with Tony Blair over the funding. And he actually, over the next period of time, I mean, for various reasons, not just because of my intervention, but it became obvious we were going to have to really increase the funding to the health service. And that was done. Now, what's happened with the Lansley bill was that as soon as the bill actually got into Parliament or was passed, Lansley was got rid of, very conveniently, because he was then, of course, a millstone round the Tory party neck. And you will remember, ladies and gentlemen, the reason why I'm so angry, the reason why I'm so angry is because the Liberal Democrats shouted that they were going to be the savers of the health service, that they were going to defeat this bill, they were going to lay down all sorts of amendments, they were going to actually make sure that this bill did not go through. And what happened, what happened in the key discussions, which in this sort of bill tend to be in the House of Lords, they didn't vote against any of the major issues that the Tories were bringing in. And in fact, that ex-Labour Party member, Baroness Williams, who of course most of us had great regard for, even though she'd left the Labour Party, we felt that she was an honest person with great integrity. She shouted how she was going to oppose and vote. She didn't vote once. And when it came to the final vote in the House of Lords, which actually sealed the bill's passage, and to send for the Queen, there was one single Labour, uh, Liberal Democrat, Lord Reeves, who actually voted against the bill. That was how we were let down by Clegg and his mates. And of course, the Tories were happy because of course, this was a way of rationing the health service. How does that work? Because of course, suddenly the health service is no longer a national health service, it's a regional health service. Because what he very cleverly did, Lansley, was to devolve all the commissioning to the least qualified medical practitioners in the health service. Now, this is not a jibe at general practitioners. General practitioners, I believe, do a very difficult job, but they look after patients in primary care. What they are not is managers of the most complex public service in any civilized country. So now we have a health service managed by people who don't want to manage it, who are commissioning treatments which they don't understand and which they can't control. And to add to the confusion, GP practices individually can actually tender for the practice that they are selling. So in fact, GPs can actually benefit 
from this health service. It's not surprising the GPs didn't finally make a massive fuss about it because GPs become quite well paid if they want to tender in certain circumstances. So they can do procedures, for example, a simple gynecological procedure like a telescope inspection of the uterus, which can be done as an outpatient procedure um, in, in, a, in a GP surgery. I'm not suggesting that you have it done, by the way, um, as somebody who's done that procedure many times. But it will be done rather inexpertly, but it can be done, and it can be done relatively more cheaply. But actually, of course, whether you'll miss the cancer in the uterus, which you're supposed to be looking for, because you've never seen one before, because you're not a gynecologist, doesn't matter. You are in a, in a position where you've been commissioned for that practice. And that's a real problem for us. When Cameron talked about the overprescription of antibiotics, of course, you know, that's increasingly done most of the time by one group of medics. It's not overprescription in hospitals. We're very, very careful in hospitals because we have that expertise. But unfortunately, with the general practice, that's actually where those resistant um, diseases are generated. Now, this is not, as I promise you, um, uh, trying to knock general practice, but in my view, you have to understand that of all medical practitioners, the general practitioner has the most difficult job. Much easier for me as a highly specialized person, when I see somebody, they've already been filtered through a system, so they're likely to have a complicated or rare disease. When you go to your family doctor with pain in the tummy, the chances are you've got indigestion, or maybe you ate something like an Indian meal the night before which didn't agree with you. The chances of you are having cancer of the bowel is about one in a hundred, but the general practitioner has to spot that. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. He has to decide which patient actually might be the one at risk with that cancer, which in his practice will be rare, but in a gastroenterologist's practice, who's specialized, will be extremely common. So I'm not for a moment suggesting that GPs have an easy job. They don't. But they should be trained and concentrating on what's needed. And what's happened with this reform is that increasingly that becomes more difficult. Now, the other thing, of course, is that now we've fragmented the health service into several hundred different practitioning groups. So, for example, you may in Basildon be entitled to get the treatment of choice for one particular condition because there's a contract, but perhaps in Billericay, you may not. Or maybe if you're in Brentwood, it may be different again. So, in the area which, of course, I'm most well known for, which is fertility medicine, and I accept that many people may feel that shouldn't be under the health service at all, but it's an interesting paradigm. You can see that happening very clearly across the country, where there are parts of the country where people can get three cycles of IVF, and next door, in the wrong street, literally in a back-to-back -back house, somebody may not be able to get any cycles of IVF or any kind of treatment for their condition because it's not regarded by that purchasing group as being something that they want to fund. So it's arbitrary. So the idea that the NHS is going to be free at the point of entry for everybody is becoming increasingly less obvious. Now, one of the issues, of course, is that we are living in a situation where one-third of you are going to die of cancer. And we are doing our best to find new drugs for cancer. If you take, for example, malignant melanoma, a few of us will get malignant melanoma. It's only one of many thousands of cancers. But there's a specific drug for malignant melanoma which actually does work. It's targeted genomically on the genes which actually cause that condition to arise. But it's costly. In fact, it's very costly. And of course, increasingly, we know, and you've seen in the newspapers, that some purchasing groups are not prepared to buy an individual drug which might cost to keep a patient alive, let's say, six months or nine months or 12 months, uh, uh, 60,000 pounds or whatever it might be. And increasingly, that rationing has come into the health service, which was never something that I was aware of when I was in training or indeed throughout my career as a medical practitioner. And there's been no attempt to work out how we deal with that. One of the issues, of course, is that the health service has been particularly bad under the Cameron government of, of actually costing out what it does. So a given treatment is fairly arbitrarily priced. And I can, again, quote the thing I know best, which is in vitro fertilization, but it would sound 
almost true for anything. We can do in vitro fertilization at Hammersmith Hospital for around 800 pounds a cycle. How much do you think the National Health Service charges the purchaser? Well, Hammersmith Hospital, to try and make a profit, because it's in such debt, is charging about 2,500 pounds for that treatment cycle to the purchaser. So the NHS is cheating on itself. Now, when it comes to many purchasers who will be uh, many providers, they will be in the private sector. Increasingly, of course, the NHS has got all these private groups that are also tendering. And with in vitro fertilization, quite typically, a large portion of the NHS work, not the private work, but the NHS work, is being done in private clinics. And of course, there, the private clinics are charging what they think the market will bear, which will be more than two and a half thousand pounds, even though, of course, the basic cross is let's say around 850. Where do you think the money goes? Well, I can tell you, directors of those clinics are incredibly wealthy. The last clinic to be sold in London to an Australian consortium, which was not a particularly good IVF clinic, I know, because I saw patients who'd failed treatment and had been very unhappy there, who came to my own practice. That last clinic was sold to an Australian consortium. Now, bear in mind, what's an IVF clinic? It has a hood to look at embryos, it's got a microscope, it's got equipment which might be worth two million pounds. I mean, that's probably generous. You can set up very cheaply with that. You'd be surprised how much it was sold for. 400 million, 400 million. The profit is amazing in the private sector. And increasingly, we're devolving hernias, we're devolving simple procedures in all sorts of ways to private clinics increasingly in that sort of way. IVF is only a paradigm and it's only a start, but it's going to follow with a whole range of treatments. In my view, that's a massive problem. The other issue about the health care bill, of course, is that there's no connection between social care and health, as you will know. One of the problems is that when people are sent out of hospital, they don't actually necessarily have the care that they need within the community. The worst example, of course, is in the commonest area completely. The one area where we do fail miserably in the United Kingdom, regrettably, is in mental health. And mental health actually is, I think, perhaps the most serious problem of all. Because something like one in four of us will suffer from clinical depression. Uh, many of us will have other conditions like that. Many children have these problems. And you'll, you may well be aware that increasingly, some of these people will need inpatient care and often that inpatient care. Well, you mentioned going to Northampton, but inpatient care is going a part of where as 150 miles from the place where they live. And you imagine if you're a depressed patient, the one thing you'd hope to have is your relatives able to visit you to actually hold your hand. I don't know how many of you have visited a mentally ill person in hospital. I have from time to time. One of my scientists was very ill mentally and was admitted to a, um, a, she was sectioned and taken into a, a, a mental health hospital. And I visited her and I was horrified. Here she was, deeply depressed. And I thought, you know, if she stays here, she's going to get much worse. And I went to the ward nurse. I said, look, I'd like to visit her twice a week and I'd like to take her out for lunch, which is what I did. And we went out to lunch to a local fish and chip shop because it was so obvious that you're know, just going to go downhill if you don't have contact with the outside world. And you imagine people who are 200 miles away, 100 miles away from their relatives. That actually is what's happening so much. So I think we have to say that this political football, which, you know, whatever, whatever we say about the Conservative Party, whatever we say about the Liberal Democrat Party, there's no question they have, in my view, as a reasonably non-political person, although I am a member of the Labour Party, I must say what I think they've done is to absolutely damage one of the great national treasures, which has been the envy of the world, but I think it's going to decline in a way that is really extremely worrying. And I think that's one of the reasons why the next election is going to be a really important event. In my view, we have to think very, very carefully if we're not going to vote Labour, because I do believe that the Labour Party, I'm not sure with a hypothecated tax in the way that Ed Miliband is suggesting at the moment, is ideal. 
it is a possibility. There are problems, I think, with that kind of taxation system. But nonetheless, the notion that we can all have access to treatment which is embedded in the Labour Party's consciousness, free at the point of access, no matter what's wrong with us, seems to me to be a fundamental right in a proper welfare state. The welfare state, the inheritance of beverage and all the other people who founded it and let it thrive from 1948 onwards. There is a sparring cost. It's a very great worry. I don't believe, I must tell you, that it needs to be unaffordable. I think we can afford cancer treatments. I think there are a whole range, and I'm very prepared to answer questions about how we could do that, because I think there are all sorts of really interesting ideas that we could manage with another government. But that's perhaps a different issue. I want to leave you on a negative note. I think that we can really save the NHS, but I think we've got to be very clear of what actually happened in 2012. For my mind, that was massive. I sat through that debate I sat through the committee stages, I sat through the report stage, and I tell you, my colleagues, all the medical people, no matter where they sat in the house, looked at each other in despair at what was actually happening to something which they cherished and which our patients cherished and which I think we should all cherish as citizens of the United Kingdom. Thank you for listening to me. Thanks to Lord Winston for, um, for that speech. I think, from Mike and I's point of view, the case and the, the kind of the challenge has been set down. We have to make next May about the NHS, and we have to make sure that that message of what this government has done and what it will continue to do uh, really has to get out there. And we know it's difficult. Last time I was in this building, I walked out, and there was 11 UKIP councillors just recently elected. Um, we have got a difficult backdrop in Basildon. Um, but the stakes have never been higher for the NHS. Um, and so if you've heard anything tonight um, that you are either appalled with in terms of, I hope, what the government are doing, or that you uh, have liked in terms of what I've said around what Labour will do, then please tell your friends, tell your neighbours, tell people that you work with, tell as many people as you possibly can.